time for me does not exist as anything like a line on which you can arrange things. Um, I would say that time is, em the expression is emergent. Uh, what for me really exists is myself and you and things, the chair I'm sitting on. Those are for me all real, or at least behind them there is something which is real. But I don't think there is any time uh, like a substance, like any fluid or anything like that. Uh, if you were to take, as you are doing now, making a film of me, you could cut that up into stills of the movie and then you could put them together at a certain distance apart to make it just exactly as happens with the movie so that it runs smoothly and it seems to make sense. And I think time is, is an illusion which emerges really out of the law that governs the whole universe, which puts things together, I call them nows, puts things together in that way to create that impression that there is an all-powerful thing moving us forward. Uh, and there's a sort of a line of timeline or something like that. But I think that's all an illusion ultimately. But you and I are real, don't worry about that. <laughs> What was it that made you move away from seeing time um, as being able to be cut up on a line to seeing it as emergent? How did you come to realise that time was an illusion? Well, it, it was a, just reading one single sentence by a great British physicist, Paul Dirac. So uh, I was 26, I wanted to become an astrophysicist. I started working on a PhD in astrophysics and I happened to read a newspaper article in Germany where I was studying about the great Paul Dirac's efforts to unify quantum, quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity. And he had come to the conclusion that there might be something wrong with the most fundamental thing that Einstein is famous for, that there's no definition of simultaneity. This you may have probably heard of the block universe or space-time in which there's no given simultaneity. You can cut up space-time in all sorts of different ways like that. And Dirac had found evidence within the dynamical structure of Einstein's great theory of gravity that that might be wrong. And he, had, he just said one sentence. He said, this result inclines me to believe that four-dimensional symmetry is not a fundamental feature of the physical world. He said this in, in an article, in, uh, published an article in 1958 with this, and I read an article in a newspaper about that, and it made me start thinking about time. And I'd never really seriously thought, what is time before? And then I realized we would never have the idea that time is passing unless we saw motion, unless we were aware of change. So ever since then I've been convinced that the primary thing is change, or if you like even difference, and that what we are feeling of time and that it passes all emerges out of differences, out of, out of the fact that we, in the first place we experience change. We would never have the idea that there is something that we call time passing if we weren't aware of things changing. So what's the difference if we move to naming it as change rather than time? because it leads you to think about how the universe might, what law might be governing the universe, the way things, how differences arise within the universe. And at the moment I'm very interested in how structure arises in the universe. We know that near the Big Bang the universe was, was very homogeneous, uniform, there was sort of waves coming backwards and forwards, if you like, but it was all very uniform. And here am I talking to you, <laughs> pretty ordered and still reasonably competent, can talk moderately good sense. How on earth does that come into existence? How, how, what is governing the universe that makes that possible? And this huge change from the conditions near the Big Bang to now, these, these are fascinating issues. And for me, they all come out of asking, what is time and saying actually time must be about differences. If, if I had my progress book that my mother so conscientiously kept with pictures of me when I was one and two and you know and look at me now 
it's still the same person, more or less, but huge differences. And that's, that's how you can tell I've got older. Uh, and, and there was a young little boy, and now there's a, a man in his early 80s. So that's, what, that's the evidence that leads people to think there's time. But I say, let's, let's just look at what really is and, and say, no, let, let's only construct our theory with what we can be reasonably confident confident does exist. And does this, uh, what is left then of the Einstein sort of space-time continuum? It, it, it emerges, the, the way I think about it, you, you could, my hands are almost the same, so I can put my one, my left hand on top of my right hand like that, and then I can, so that's sort of putting it in, in spatial where it is one on top of each other and then if it's slightly different I'll put a certain distance between them. Now that's not a real thing, that's in my mind to try and make sense of how, how my left hand can be placed relative to my right and how much difference there is between them. So if I have lots of hands or lots of movies, uh, stills of a movie, I can stack them, I call that horizontal stacking and then vertical stacking. And in, in all cases, the real thing is, is, is my hands, but then I stack them one after another, both this way and that way, using only what is the structure in the hands. And out of that, I can construct space-time. And this is not the way people normally think about it. But when you look at it that way, things are different. And I say we must philosophize about these things differently. Uh, so th that, that's the difference there. So in a way, time is an illusion. My hands are not an illusion. But saying that they're stacked like that is, is something that I've put into it to understand the difference between my left hand and my right hand. So how would you then understand uh, why we feel like we experience time, the temporal nature of reality? That is the real, the big problem, where does, how does consciousness come into this? So I start off with the great insight that the geologists had in, in the late 18th century. They got very interested in studying the earth and they discovered what is called deep time. They realized that if they were to understand that the structure that the earth has now, and by the way, that structure has hardly changed since they started thinking about these things well over 200 years ago. They supposed that the earth was a physical object that had been changing in accordance with definite laws of nature over a very long period. And this led them to the idea of deep time. And it's all encoded in you could see that the rocks and the fossils are, in some senses, you could see them as records which you could interpret and say, this is how the past unfolded. And there's a wonderful statement, Lamarck, who had uh, ideas about evolution before Darwin, they turned out to be wrong. But Lamarck has a wonderful s sentence. He said, the surface of the earth is its own historian. It all is encoded in the surface of the earth. If you look around you here, it really is behind me, is, is the history of the earth. A geologist can deduce all sorts of things from that. And I call that a time capsule. Now I would say that in my mind, there's something like a time capsule like that, that there's lots of memories and they're all, they're all consistent really in a way. Uh, there's a wonderful moment at the end of the Midsummer Night's Dream when Hippolyta says, no, it must be real what these lovers went through because they, they tell their story and it, it hangs together. It, it, it's a consistent story. And she says, it grows to a thing of great consistency. So this is why I believe I am a person and was that little boy Julian many years ago. And I think actually the experience of you, of me seeing my hands moving and you seeing them is because actually in your brain, all at once, are quite a lot of images of my hand. And somehow or other, when the brain, the brain tells us a story, it, it presents us with a narrative. And I think what is happening is that it has a whole lot of pictures all at once and presents them 
as, as movement like that. But it's, not, it's really in a, in a whole lot of snapshots there. And the, most, the last book that Oliver Sacks wrote called The River of Consciousness, he talks about the insights that neuroscience is developing. And it does really seem to be that the, the brain processes information and presents, first of all, several snapshots. And then we see them as, as, as movement. So I don't think there is movement out in the world. It's something that the brain, it's a narrative that some to us comes to us through this utter miracle of consciousness. How that nobody knows how consciousness works. Anybody who says they do, that that's just nonsense to, to, to pretend that you know that. So I would say the only evidence for the past and that there is something that we really could call the past is the consistency of our records, the consistency of our, our memory. And the fact that we actually see movement. I think that's all it is. You, as I move my hand like that, you see my hands both there and there, and you see the movement. But I suspect that's, that's a narrative that the brain is presenting. So that's, that's my explanation of why time itself is an illusion, and even motion is an illusion. But the fact that I can put my hands like this in different positions, that's not an illusion. That's real. So do we have to have a uh, sort of trust in our own memory or the consistency of our own memory to feel like the past is real? Oh, or, go on. Yeah. Or is that just an illusion? Like, do we have to give up? Uh, I would say that's the ultimate tragedy in life when your brain has deteriorated. I know this very acutely because my poor wife uh, developed Alzheimer's over a very long period and uh, she died just under two years ago. So, uh, I mean three years ago, look how I'm getting that wrong. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the saddest thing. But she, she still was getting some sense of her identity until till, till, till the end. But, but that that's when the connections in the brain no longer hold together. There's, they, they, they fall apart, things fall apart within the brain. And of course, that is, that is a sad end of life. And, and I, at my age, I'm beginning to struggle with people's names and things like that. But I still at least can talk about time <laughs> and remember a line or two from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, so has it for, for you personally your own theory of time uh, affected how you sort of experience like feelings of sort of like regret which may people might uh, consign to the past or hopes for the future? Well, there's plenty of things that I regret about the past and some of the m more stupid and unpleasant things they do, they, they make me wince when, when I recall them. But I think that's actually a, a something to stop me doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think that's probably a healthy thing. But the main thing I have from this is, is, is enjoy the moment, carpe diem. To make the most of every moment of your life as, as best you can. Um, so that's sort of the philosophy I've, I've developed. And I put this in the epilogue of, of the book that I wrote about this called The End of Time, which came out it's nearly 20 years ago. It was published. Um, so that's... There you see I'm using <laughs> conventional terms, but uh, I could put that all in my language of time capsules and <laughs> uh, shapes of the universe and, and, and so on. But, um, yeah. And in terms of the ramifications for physics, does this have a influence in quantum physics and the gap between classical and quantum physics? It might. I'm very cautious about saying uh, uh, that we're on to the right track. Um, at the moment, actually, I'm uh, with my three collaborators. Uh, we think we're making real progress in uh, just within classical physics, understanding why the past is so different from the present and the future. Because this is the great mystery of the growth of entropy, which came with the discovery of the laws of thermodynamics in, in, eight, in the 1850s. Uh, so all the known laws of nature work equally well in the two directions of time, then why are all the processes we observe in the universe all going in the same direction? 
we are all getting older in the same direction, you just like me, and all the stars are. We never meet anyone getting younger. Where does this colossal asymmetry in time come from if it's not in the fundamental laws? So uh, seven years ago, to make a concession to time, I, an idea occurred to me which actually I happen to know about a, a rather important result in, discovered in Newton's theory of gravity in 1772. Uh, this led me to the idea that the Big Bang, so if we pretend there is a, a timeline of, of the universe, which by which I mean just each individual now, what it's like, like the stills of the movie. Suppose you have a a long infinite timeline of the universe. And I would say that the Big Bang is, if you like, in the middle. And we're on one side, and our time is going that way. And then there's another universe, or the other half of the t whole timeline, where time is going that way. Now, people who are on that side would find that time is going forward in exactly the same way as we find it on this side. It's all very chaotic at the Big Bang. There's no structure there. So we can't see through the Big Bang to the other side, and they can't see through to us. But that restores the overall symmetry. So the overall symmetry of the whole universe reflects the underlying law, which is symmetric in both ways. But on the two sides, the direction of experienced time is opposite. So that's quite a simple, neat thing. So I call this the... Janus point, or Janus point, that the Big Bang, uh, of, of course after the Roman god who looks in two opposite directions of time at once. And I'm writing a book about this with the title is The Janus Point and a, a New Theory of Time's Arrows and the Big Bang. I hope I will get it finished. <laughs> I'm working away hard. <laughs> I've fairly recently had my 82nd birthday, so I better get it finished. <laughs> so I'm, I'm concentrating, no, fairly recently, back in February actually. Um, but it's a nice simple idea and several quite interesting things uh, are fit into this idea quite nicely. So, um, and what I'm do you see hopeful. as the main, the main challenges with hmm? this? What, what, what do you see or foresee as the main challenges that um, you'll have to tackle in the, well, first of all, to develop, or well, first of all, to show that this is a, this model is based on Newton's theory of gravity, and quite a big challenge is to show that it will also work with Einstein's theory of gravity. Now, we've made a, my collaborators made a first step in that, and they've showed that in some senses, there are conditions in which you can go through the Big Bang in general relativity, and not only in the uh, uh, the comparable situation in Newton's theory. Um, then there would be more detailed work to be done, but the real challenge would be to make this quantum mechanical, to unify quantum mechanics with this. And we've got ideas about this, but people have been trying for 60, 70 years to unify quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of gravity, and they, to be frank, they haven't got terribly far yet, <laughs> or despite them, the claims that made them like might like to make. Um, so that's it there. But one thing we do think is that uh, we concentrate on what we say the shape of the universe in any instant. So uh, if you have a triangle it has a shape and a size but I think you'll agree that the shape is much more important than the size because if I hold up a, an equilateral triangle in front of your eyes and move it backwards and forwards the, the shape doesn't change but the size does. So you would say there's a question mark over the size, whether it's fundamental. Now, if, you can, if that triangle is the whole universe, you'd need a ruler outside that triangle to measure its size. But if the universe is everything, that doesn't make sense. So we've developed something we call shape dynamics to describe the whole universe. And we think that it might be possible in that framework to unify quantum mechanics with gravity, with Einstein's theory of gravity, because it's taking away something that shouldn't be there. And in fact, all of the, so far as really all of the existing approaches to quantum gravity, in some way or other, are bringing in an external scale, which I don't think should be there, or at least there's a, there's a question mark over it, and possibly a big one. So that's our hope. But 
there's, there's plenty to be getting on with in the meanwhile. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.